of the environment of the operating room. So all these things that are, uh, you know, we kind of take for granted are very important in that environment, trying to get good data. Um, so the things I want to talk about uh, for the next hour, and we'll, we'll probably be interrupted, so we'll probably be a little bit and a little bit, but uh, important concepts, Ohm's Law, everybody's familiar with it, but it's, it worth, it's worthwhile to refresh our memories. Frequency, reactance of capacitors, there's a lot of capacitance in the operating impedance, filters, Differential amplifiers, how you record the signals, you know, amplify them. A to D conversion, because that gives you your sensitivity. And ground, and ground is extremely important. So these are the things that we're going to talk about in order to start to talk about real data. Uh, you've got to have an idea. Uh, so, uh, This, this is a, uh, a diagram of the electrical strength of different signals in the operating room. And this axis is, in, it's a log axis, so it's orders of magnitude, orders of magnitude. So uh, the smallest thing on here is brainstem auditory potentials, okay? And the biggest thing on here is the Bode. And the difference between the two, the difference between the two are nine orders of magnitude. Nine orders of magnitude. So the difference is, is 10 to the ninth. So the environment in which you're working is, has a lot more noise than the signals we're trying to record. Does that make sense? But, so the Bovi <coughs> is at about a thousand volts, roughly. The Cautery is about at a hundred volts. Okay, the, the half cell potential set up by an improper choice of electrodes is at about one volt. The, the noise from the electrical circuits, the electrical system in the room, in, in the United States it's 60 hertz here, it's 50, but it's 0.1 volts. EMG is a thousandth of a volt, a millivolt. EEG, EEG is on the order of 100 microvolts. Visually volt potentials are on the order of 10 microvolts. SCPs are on the order of a microvolt, and the brainstem potentials are on the order of a tenth of a microvolt. So you think about that range. You're trying to record these signals in an environment in which the, the, the noise is very large and the signals are very small. So that's what makes the technical part of this difficult. There's a lot of basic concepts, and uh, some of these we've talked about already. Uh, but it's important to kind of have these clear in your mind because when you go to look at the data, which we're going to start to do in a lot of detail, these are the things that drive the data. So, voltage, we talked about that. The volt is a measure of energy, joules per coulomb current, the flow of electrons, direct current, okay, direct current, that's electrons moving in only one direction. Alternating current is electrons moving in two directions, so electrons go one way and then they go the other way. So it's important to understand that this distinction. You can have a signal that's oscillating and it will only be direct current because it's above zero all the time. You can have a signal which is below zero and it will only be direct current, direct current even though it's oscillating. 
So to be alternating current, it's got to cross the zero line so that it drives the electrons in two different directions. But, so that's a concept that will come up. Resistance, this is opposition to direct current. Uh, very important in the diagnostic lab, in the operating room. We want to get this value as low as possible with your electrodes. Impedance, same idea as resistance. Resistance is you've got direct current and you've got whatever is dissipating energy to push that direct current, that's the resistance. If you have an alternating current and you've got something resisting the flow of that alternating current, it's called impedance. So the, the difference in the ideas are that one requires a frequency in the signal, the other one doesn't require a frequency. Frequency, <coughs> number of cycles per second measured in hertz, so we use the language hertz. Cathode, we talked about that. It's typically the negative or a black terminal. It's the acceptor of cations. It's the uh, provider of anions. So in, in the old days, if people worked with vacuum tubes, you know, to build a radio, the thing that provided the electrons for the vacuum tube was called the cathode. Same idea. Provided the, the anions. The anode is a positive terminal that accepts uh, the anions and uh, is a source of cations. Conductors, those are the wires that easily allow electrons to move. So they have very low resistance. But they do have some resistance. So it's important to bear in mind that any any conductor is, is something which has some resistance or impedance and can change the signals. So, uh, these are concepts that we're going to work at to understand a little bit. The, the other concept that's important is amplifiers. This increases the signal amplitude by the gain of the amplifier. So you have an input signal, you have some multiplier and you have an output signal and that amplifier is what provides this multiplier. We're going to talk about occasionally I'll say well the gain of this was 20 dB. So dB is just a nomenclature. You don't have to worry about what it means. It just it gives you uh, it's one of those things you just kind of know it's there but it, it, it tells you what the gain is. One of the things we're going to touch on is filters, which is extremely important. Uh, when you record these signals, you're always going through an amplifier, and the amplifier always has filters. And so the filters shape the data the way you see it. So you, you have to have some core understanding of how you're filtering the data, otherwise you won't understand why the data looks the way it does. You may expect it to look one way and it looks differently because you have your filters set in a way that's different than what you had anticipated from the insulators. Insulators are things which have very high resistance. So they prevent electrons from flowing. So the way to think about an insulator is it's, it's a very, very, very high resistance or impedance. Uh, it's materials which do not free, freely give up electrons. So, uh, and they're very important in working in the operating room. Capacitors, these are divide, things which store charge. And you know, we think about capacitors as um, a, a device, but they're not a device. In the operating room, 
you could have two wires close to each other and they will set up a capacitance between them. There will be charge that will accumulate between the two wires. And the same thing in the diagnostic lab. Uh, so uh, it's just important to have in your mind the idea that these are real things. Uh, and we'll go through this. Ohm's law, this is something everybody's familiar with. It's the relationship between voltage and current and resistance or impedance. So if voltage is equal to current times resistance, you can write it these other ways. Uh, voltage is also equal to current times impedance. Impedance is a, really a complex, something we call a complex number. It's resistance plus reactance. This symbol is a J, it's an imaginary number. It just allows you to think about these things. But Ohm's law is important. It's also important to realize, we'll talk about this a little bit, <clears throat> this is a linear relationship, B equals IR. If I goes up by 2 and the resistance is the same, the voltage goes up by 2. But you, you can have nonlinear relationships between voltage and current. So the current will go up by 1 and the voltage will go up by 3. And that's, that's acceptable. It just doesn't obey Ohm's law. Uh, and there are devices that we work with that do that. Electron flow, we've talked about this ad nauseum. This is the actual direction of current movement. So uh, we need to think about, you know, we're kind of started off with this esoteric discussion of, of what we're measuring, but in fact that's the reality of what we're measuring. And we look at it in a certain way, but to understand what's happening in that certain way, we have to think about it that way. So, uh, again, just to emphasize Ohm's law, it's linear, it's got voltage and current, and we just map on a straight line if it's a linear system. When it's nonlinear, we'll talk about that explicitly. Most of the time, we'll assume, for purposes of our discussion, that we're linear. Uh, but I'll point out where we get into the nonlinear properties, and they can radically change the data that you're looking at. And if you don't, if you're not aware of that, you'll, you'll misinterpret data. So frequency, it's always worthwhile to step back and make sure people have a very concrete idea of what frequency is. So the units of frequency are cycles per second or hertz. And you can see it's the changing of a signal in a very uniform way, oscillatory behavior. Frequency changes in terms of the number of these cycles that occur per second. So low frequency, medium frequency, high frequency, uh, number of oscillations per second, cycles per second, or hertz. So 1,000 hertz is different than 100 hertz, is different than 10 hertz. Uh, but they all share a common characteristic set of characteristics. They're all defined by the period of the wave. So a period is the time between two identical points on a frequency. Okay. And the frequency, the frequency is just one over the t. So if you divide one by the period t, you get the number of cycles. So th this is the way we think about it. People that do EEGs, they think about the frequency content of the EEGs all the time. It's one of their major descriptors is the signal is this frequency range or this frequency range or this. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, is this clear? Everybody understand? <coughs> Uh, energy is related to the amplitude of the frequency. So a signal which has low amplitude will have low energy. 
a signal which has high amplitude has high energy. So you can have a signal at the same frequency, so the same number of oscillations per second, which can have a little bit of energy, or it can have a lot of energy, depending on its amplitude. Uh, and that's important to kind of understand that idea. Capacitance is an idea which we, we come up against all the time. And the, the core idea of capacitance is that you have two plates, think of them as two plates, it can be two wires, uh, it can be anything, uh, separated by some small distance, in which charge is accumulated on one plate and therefore charge accumulates on the other plate. And this is a function of the frequency that's driving the signal. So, uh, Capacitance is described by this equation here, which is called the reactance of the capacitor. And it's a function of the frequency of the signal and the capacitance. So every thing which creates a capacitor has a value called the capacitor. And then that produces this reactance, which is a function of the frequency. So, and it's inversely inversely related to the frequency. So the higher the frequency, the lower the reactance. The lower the frequency, coming here, lower frequency, the higher the reactance. And this is the key to all filter design. So all the filters you use are based on that single idea. Uh, doesn't matter how you design them, they, they end up capturing that core idea. And I'll show you how in a second. So it's very important. You don't you don't have to you don't have to memorize the equation or anything. What you have to have in your idea in your mind is the idea that with the capacitor, as the frequency go up goes up, its resistance its resistance to current flow goes down. That's the core idea. And so as the frequency go da goes down, the resistance, the impedance to current flow goes up. So that's, that's the thing that makes the filters work. And we use filters all the time. So here's the, the core idea of what a filter is. Uh, in this, this little circuit I've drawn here is called a voltage divider. So there's a resistance, and there's an R1, and there's a resistance 2. And there's a voltage in, and there's a ground here. So the ground just provides a return path for current to flow. So ground is a, is a figment of imagination that engineers use to talk about how paths are created. So the current flows through R1, and flows through R2. The voltage out of this, between these two resistors, is given by this equation. So the voltage out is R2 divided by R1 plus R2. So you can see that if you have R1 and it's very, very large, then, and R2 is small, then the voltage out is going to be very small most of the voltage is going to be lost across R1. Just it's a very simple equation. Uh, and this is the core idea of all filters, except that you have a, in a filter you either have a capacitor here or a capacitor here. So this is important to, to be able to visualize this in your minds, what that ratio is telling you. So you can picture now, if R2 is very large, let's say R2 is a million, so you have a million, let's say R1 is 100. So you have 100 and you have a million, so V out, this voltage out here would be a million divided by 100 plus a million, so it would be a million divided by a million, which would be one, so V out 
would be identical to Vn, would be capturing all of Vn. Okay. If R1 is a million and R2 is a hundred, then you would have a hundred divided by a million plus a hundred. But V out would be zero because the voltage would all be dropped across here. So that, that's the idea of all the filters we use in EEGs and everything, except we make one change. So we can replace this resistor by our capacitor. And remember, our capacitor has the equation 1 over 2 pi Fc. The important thing in that equation is the frequency. So let's look at this as a voltage divider. So the, if the frequency is high, so F is high, the reactance of this capacitor, its resistance to current flow, is going to be very low. So the voltage will all be dropped across this resistor, and the voltage out of the filter, the V out, will be very low. Applying the same equation, just substituting R2 for Xc for R2. So you, get, you can see the idea. You know, where do you drop the voltage? And this is what's happening in the filters. Is that, is that clear? It can be confusing. I, I, we'll take a look at how it works. So this is the way it works. So this is now a low-pass filter. So if we go back, this is the same as the drawing on the next slide. So it represents a low-pass filter. So XC is going to when, when uh, the frequency is low, okay, the, the, uh, you can see what happens. So when the frequency is low, so here's our R, here's our capacitor. The frequency is low, the, the impedance of this capacitor is very high, and the voltages pass through at the low frequencies. But when you get to the high frequencies, the impedance goes down, and the voltages that are passed through go down. Okay. Is that clear? So that's the basis of a, of a low-pass filter. The, the low frequencies are passed because this impedance is very high, and therefore the voltage is, is dropped across that capacitor. And so you see that voltage out here. So conversely, for a high-pass filter, you put the capacitor in this leg and the resistor here. And again, capacitance, the reactance is a function of the frequency. For a low frequency, this capacitance is very high. So the reactance is very high, so the voltages are dropped across that. And as the, as the frequency goes up, going up in frequency, then the reactance of this goes down and the voltages are dropped across the resistor. So that's the basis of all the filters and all the equipment that's used in the diagnostic lab or the operating room. It's that simple idea. Now, how you build it may be different. You know, how, you, how you actually build it may, may be different, but it doesn't matter. That's, that's the, the core concept of how this works. And this is important because you can see the, this is a function of frequency, this is amplitude. So every signal that we have is, a fun, is composed of a bunch of uh, signals at different frequencies together. And so a filter will get rid of different frequencies in different ways. And so it will change how the signal looks to you. So it changes how it looks. So you can take something which looks one way and you can make it look entirely differently by setting these parameters, which you do with either in software or with switches.
So you've got to have this, this some some awareness of how this works at a, a certain level to make sure you've got the idea of, of what the data actually looks like. And these are important because they also allow you to get rid of noise that you don't want to see. So is, is this clear? Is there anything that I can... So passband filter, again, a simple idea. You've got a high pass filter and a low pass filter, and you stick them together, and you've got a passband filter. Uh, they're usually two separate filters, and you just stick them together, and they, they pass. It's called a pass band because it passes frequencies in the middle. And you can see there's some region in here where um, the, uh, uh, pre the signal's not attenuated. So we call this attenuation as a function of frequency. Okay, so uh, that, that's what we're going to say about filters. Again, we're, we're trying to get at the core concepts to make sure that uh, uh, we've got this common understanding of what we're doing to the signal. The, the other key element is this idea of an amplifier. And we use, in the, in the equipment that's used in the operating room and also in the diagnostic lab, we use what are called differential amplifiers. Uh, and, and the idea behind a differential amplifier is you have, essentially they're all built the same way. They're built out of three individual amplifiers. And the idea is to take the difference between two signals. That's why they're called differential. So uh, in this case, you can see there's an input here to amplifier A, which goes into amplifier C, and this is where the output's going to be seen. And there's an input here, which goes into amplifier B, which then goes into amplifier C. And then there's some patient ground, ground being a patient reference. Uh, uh, we'll use, the word ground is used in different ways, and in this case it means a reference on the patient. Uh, and the, uh, the signal in the operating room or anywhere may look like this. And this represents a lot of noise. And this represents the signal of interest. So this is a lot of noise. This is the signal of interest. When you put this noise, which is aligned, through an amplifier set up like this, this is a negative terminal, this is a positive terminal. Unfortunately, it's not marked that way. These signals are subtracted from each other, so that differential. And they come out here with these signals being subtracted from each other, being eliminated. And the signal that you're interested in, which is this little thing here, being added together. So this is a plus path, this is a negative path. The output is this plus this because it's a negative signal subtracted becomes a positive signal. But the noise is eliminated, and this is called common. This is the common mode signal, and and the elimination of that is called common mode rejection. So your amplifier, when you use it, you'll see a number on that amplifier, and it will tell you the common mode rejection will be uh, 100 dB, or it'll, it'll be 1 in 10,000. So it, what, what it's telling you is that it's going to eliminate uh, 1 in 10,000. You're going to be left with 1 in 10,000 of whatever the common world signal was. So every amplifier will tell you that, which you can expect to see. So, uh, so what that means is if you have a signal, a common mode noise, remember, if we go back to that original chart, 
the, the, the noise from the 60 hertz or 50 hertz was a, was a volt, you would expect to have one ten thousandth of a volt of common mode noise left if you were going through a differential amplifier which had a common mode rejection ratio of, of 10,000. So it's telling you something physically about what you will expect the noise to look like coming through that amplifier. This signal is not common, okay? It's two different signals are going in opposite directions. So they actually are amplified. And this is an important point we'll come back to again when you look at voltages from the brain or from anywhere, they're the difference between two points. So they're the, what you're ultimately going to see is going to be the difference between what those two voltages were. And so they can add or they can subtract and in ways that are very clear, but not in ways that you might expect. So people that do EEGs all the time are very well aware of this because they're looking for differences from one part of the brain to the other part of the brain. And they know that depending on how they set up their montage, things will look differently. And the same thing works in the operating room. So how you structure the montage, montage being how you position your electrodes, is extremely important in terms of A, getting rid of the common mode noise, getting the signal as clean as you can, and B, making the part of this thing you're interested in as big as you can or as realistic as you can. So, uh, and then you can imagine you have this kind of amplifier along with the filters. So you've got actually the amplifier and then the filters. And it's the combination of those things which get rid of common mold noise, get rid of frequency components you're not interested in, and allow you to pull out the signal you're interested in. Does this make sense? Anybody have any questions? So, again, just to review this concept is polarity of recording. And this is something which people that do EEGs think about incessantly. Uh, this triangle uh, represents the differential amplifier, the multiple stages we had before, and you have an input coming in where something's being measured at one point, something's being measured at, at another point. The way to think about it is this is a negative terminal, this is a positive terminal. So what's coming in on this terminal is going to be amplified directly. What's coming in on this terminal is going to be inverted, and what comes out is the sum of the two, which is zero. Okay. So you could have, you could be recording from two different sites, and because you've picked, depending on what you want to do, you've picked the worst sites, the signals are actually subtracted from each other, and you don't see what you're interested in. Or you could pick different sites, and you get the polarity going positive and you get the polarity going negative. This is a negative going wave, so it goes through a negative terminal, it becomes positive and you get out twice the signal. So this idea of polarity uh, of uh, electrodes, you know, where the electrodes are positioned with respect to the signals you're trying to look at, and the realization that the differential amplifier is subtracting the two is really important. You've got to think about how you, how you conceive of data being generated, signals being generated within the brain. So electroencephalographers, they think about this incessantly. They, they work at, at defining different montages to bring out different features. And we do the same thing 
trying to get at data in the operating room. You've got to get the right set of electrode combination. So this is another example of our common mode rejection. So differential amplifier, again, it's this three amplifier chain. We have a negative input, we have a positive input. You can see there's really two frequency components here. There's this noise, which is the high frequency stuff. And there's this underlying slow signal, which is what we're interested in. So when you run this signal through a differential amplifier, the common mode re is, signal is rejected. The common mode is this high frequency stuff. You can see it lines up exactly did that on purpose. And then what's the signal we're interested in is out of phase. So it's going to, when you subtract it, it's going to add. So it's going to be accentuated. So this is supposed to represent that. You can see this is a large slow wave for the signal, which is this and this. Okay. So common mode rejection gets rid of this stuff and allows us keep the signal we're interested in. If the signal we're, we're interested in is in the right frequency. So you, you've got to, as you think through how you're going to record this data, you've got to be aware of these things and you've got to think about where you're going to put your electrodes uh, for recording. You've got, to, you've got to think about how susceptible each electrode is to picking up common voltages, common noise from the operating room. And you've got to think about when you take the difference between these, because you're always differencing pairs of electrodes, what that will do to the signals you're interested in. And, and we were going to do a practicum uh, where we actually demonstrated that uh, uh, with median nerve potentials that you could by how you position the electrodes, entirely eliminate the signal you're interested in, uh, or accentuate the signal you're in. Unfortunately, we don't have any equipment to do it. So, um, is this conceptually clear to everybody? So, other, other things that, that are important when you think about recording data one is the dynamic range of the equipment. And this is the total range of voltages that a system will record accurately. And I want to emphasize this word, record accurately. When you have an amplifier, uh, and you can set the gain on the amplifier, okay? Uh, so you say you have a signal which is a microvolt at the input. And you have an amplifier which can have an output of, of half a volt, but you set the gain at a million. Okay, the gain, if you have a microvolt signal and you multiply it by a million gain, you don't want to give you one volt out, but it can't because the amplifier can only give you half a volt. So this idea is called the dynamic range. And so Here's the actual signal. This is my one volt signal, microvolt signal amplified by a million. The amplifier can't handle that, so it, it saturates, it clips the signal. And that's what this red, red line represents. So, again, this is something you've got to think about because if you set the parameters on the amplifiers incorrectly, which you control, then you can saturate the signals coming out of, of the amplifier and they will change how the final signal looks. They will cause significant changes in that signal and it may be such that you can't even interpret it, it gets so distorted. Um, so again, it's a very simple idea. You've got to know what this range of your amplifier is that uh, will amplify. We call this linear amplification if you can do that, and this is nonlinear. 
you've got to know what that linear range for your amplifier is, and the manufacturer will tell you somewhere in the, in the material. They'll say you should, you know, this is what you can expect, and you've got to design your protocols so that they work that way. And this applies again whether you're in the diagnostic lab or the operating room. Uh, so uh, dynamic range, a simple idea, but again very important to, to have a, a handle on it. A to D conversion. Uh, so uh, Um, well, every, all the equipment today is digital, so you, ha you have an analog signal, you know, you have your brain waves, and you're going to work in that digitally. In the, in, the, in the old days, it was all analog, so you didn't have this analog to digital converter. You would have a, um, and we didn't have avagers the way we have them now, but you would, you take an analog signal, You'd amplify it and you'd look at an analog soon. And you might look at it on a polygraph, you know, a pen, pen system. Now we have, we have to do what's called conversion. So A to D stands for analog to digital conversion. And that involves two steps in itself. Both of these you need to be aware of because they again will change how the signals look when you go to interpret them, which is the key to everything. That's why each of these steps is important. The first is the sampling frequency. So remember, we have a signal, and it's oscillating. So it has a certain frequency component. There's a theorem called the Nyquist sampling theorem that says that if you have a signal oscillating at one cycle per second, in order to capture that signal, you have to sample it at at least two samples per second. Okay. And, and if you sample it less than that, the data is not going to look like the real data. So you've got to be aware of the frequency content of the signal, and you've got to make sure that your A to D converter is running at a high enough frequency. Now, these figures are on the sticks that I gave you, so you can look at them there. The Nyquist sampling theorem is uh, a minimum, a minimum sampling rate. So if I have a signal at one hertz, I have to sample it at two hertz to know what the frequency content is. But it doesn't mean that I can accurately reconstruct that signal. So do you get the difference? There's the frequency component, and then there's how well you can reconstruct the signal. And they're two different things. And the sampling frequency to reconstruct a signal accurately is a, is a more complicated question. But to, to capture 95%, 95% of the information in a signal, you have to sample at least 10 times the highest frequency component. So if I have a 1 hertz signal, the Nyquist sampling theorem says I need to sample at 2 hertz just to know what the frequency is. But if I want to capture 95% of the information in that signal, I have to sample at 10 hertz. So you've got to over, we call it oversampling. You've got to sample at a lot higher rate. This is really important because it will change what the data looks like. And on every uh, system out there that you can buy to do interoperative monitoring, you can control this. And People will set the sampling frequencies too low and they will see uh, signals that do not represent the thing they're trying to see. And, uh, and it will lead to poor conclusions. Hey, Bob. Yeah. So they're ready downstairs. Oh, okay. I have a question. Yeah. Why not just say, 
oversample everything. Why not just turn that all the way up and say as much as you can? What's the downside to that? Why, why is it adjustable? Um, the reason it was, it's been historically adjustable has been because every every word that you sample requires memory space, storage space, processor speed. So it's a trade-off okay, so on the engineering downside. side. But in fact, the, the point you're making is as the technology is getting better and better, you can just set these rates at very high rates. So like in our system, we set the sampling rate at 32 kilohertz per channel, and we just save everything because of that very reason. But uh, historically, most of the systems don't do that. So how do you want to, they're ready for you downstairs. Okay. Um, they can video if you want to talk, explain what you're doing down there, or do you want to set up a camera and then come up here and have and explain it as he's. I don't know what we're teaching. Are you going to teach the setup? Are you going to teach kind of? Well, I got to see what he's got. But okay. I think they want to talk about the setup and the data. So maybe so. they can video while you set up, and you can yeah. explain from yeah. down there on the TV. Yeah. Okay, because yes. they're right. They're ready now. Okay, and then we'll come back because I want to. I want you to understand this idea of amplitude resonance.